All right, joining me now here on the Matthew Filipovich Show is Karen Narevsky. Karen is a community organizer based in Somerville, Massachusetts, and a writer for Jacobin Magazine, which you can find at jacobinmag.com. Karen, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. All right. So, Karen, you actually have an article up at Jacobin called The Suburbanization of the U.S. Working Class. I guess let's begin by just laying a baseline and discussing the initial flight to and creation of suburbs in the United States. Sure. Well, one of the really interesting things that um, that I was able to learn about by writing this piece is um, kind of the history of how the suburbs came to be in the U.S. and how much it's always been tied to um, class and economic opportunities. Uh, so cities have always been ports of entry for a lot of different people, um, immigrants, workers. Um, they've, you know, traditionally been seats of government, at least for um for newer states, um, but there was always a push for those who could afford it to escape from um, kind of the messiness of the city and the proximity to working class people um, and create a little uh, space from this for themselves outside of urban centers. So that's where you see kind of the original streetcar suburbs um, developing very much along with early public transportation in the forms of streetcars and trolleys and that kind of thing. Um, and initially, uh, suburbs were somewhat mixed in income because you had wealthy people sort of um, creating the suburbs, and then you had uh, working class servants who at that time tended to live in close proximity, if not with their employers. Um, so you had kind of a mix of, uh, of class backgrounds in the suburbs, but it was very much driven by the desire of the upper classes to escape from the city, which was seen as kind of a a dirty, polluted place. (laughs) And now we've actually kind of seen that trend in a lot of cities kind of start to reverse itself, so much so that much of the working class is actually being driven out of most big cities. Yeah, it's it's an interesting trend. It's happening a lot in in big cities. where, um, you know, I talk about David Harvey in the piece, and David Harvey has a pretty interesting argument that um, throughout the last, you know, 50, 60 years, the working class has created a lot of surplus value, if you think of the city as kind of a a place of production, that um, there's a lot of great um, networks and infrastructure and um, community and culture in cities that have been created by the poor and working class, in addition to a lot of resources like public transportation and, um, and commercial centers, and now a lot of, uh, more, uh, professional and, uh, elite people are saying, well, gee, we'd really like to take advantage of that. And in fact, I think we will. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so what the, the, so talk a bit about the result of the the rich and the 1% coming back in because it, essentially what it does is it gentrifies and prices out uh the working class and poor people of color and, and moves them further and further out away from the core of 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 cities. Yeah, so there's a one aspect of that which has to do with um with a more limited access to resources and to social networks um that I wrote about in the piece but actually, the reason that I became interested in it was through my work as an organizer. Um, so Somerville is right outside of Boston. It's historically been, you know, it's a separate city. Some might consider it a suburb, but it's a pretty urban environment. There's a lot of public transportation. There's a lot of um, social services catering to immigrants and working class people. Um, and there's a lot of uh, historically affordable housing. And um, so my work is... Uh, with members of the community, getting them involved in different campaigns um, that our members are leading for affordable housing and jobs. And one thing that I found is that a lot of the leaders in the community work that's happening here are leaving because they're losing their homes, they can't afford their rent, um, they don't have a good job. And so it's really detrimental actually to um, community organizing and social mobilization when people who are invested in the community and who have roots here and have a lot of knowledge about the problems that exist and, and some potential solutions don't have the economic stability to stay. It's really damaging to the community. I'm talking to Karen Narevsky, community organizer in Somerville, Massachusetts, writer for Jacobin Magazine, jacobinmag.com. 
So, and, and kind of the the one of the major cruxes of of the piece is that um, old models of community organizing, if 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 if, uh, if working class organizing against the the one percent, a lot of those old models don't actually apply anymore because of the ways that people have been the working class has been pushed out of cities at least before you had people in a closer proximity you had you know community knowledge going along here talk a little bit about how that that model of organizing has been has been in a lot of ways uh gutted yeah so it's um you know as i mentioned earlier one of the reasons that um that wealthier people are moving back into cities is because there's this great access to public transportation. And so when you have poor and working class people displaced to the suburbs, um, they don't necessarily have that access to good transportation. Um, Things are much less densely populated. And so it might not be as easy to get 100 people together for a rally in front of City Hall. Um, So some of those tactics might still apply, and and there could be... um, you know, there could be strong networks, but I think it's going to be important for community leaders to think about um, what's going to be most effective um, in their specific context. It, it all comes down to the importance of, of organizers and leaders who are really attuned to their local context um, and know um, know what's going to be effective, um, know how to mobilize people and how to sort of build that um, confidence in organizing in a way that can also be effective in in that community. And so um, it could be that there are some models of um, inner city organizing that are really adaptable to suburbs, but some might not be. And I think it's important just for us to to think about that and for people not to feel like this displacement means that everyone will just give up and go live in the suburbs and that's the end of the really important social movements that cities were the home to in um, the 20th century, but think about how we can sort of grow and expand those movements into the suburbs. You know, there's always going to be some, I think, some concentration, hopefully, of working class people in cities, at least in cities like New York, which haven't demolished their public housing. You still see really high percentages of working class people. Um, and so that's not going away in some places, but we're going to need to expand those movements as um, social geographies change and hopefully also allow um, allow conversations about how people can actually reclaim space in the cities that they're now being um, being pushed out of.